Uh, I'm Gabe Abella, I'm organizational coach at JP Morgan Chase, a credit Kanban trainer, uh, as well as a uh, Flow Lab facilitator, which I'm excited to be able to bring to uh, my students. And uh, hopefully, if you're around uh, Wednesday, you can come see that as well. Um, I do need to get some administration out of the way. Um, I do need to tell you that all the opinions I'm going to share are my own and not those of JP Morgan Chase, so thank you for putting up with that. And I really have two purposes as an organizational coach. Uh, the first is to the teams, individuals that I serve, and really what I'm looking for is creating a rewarding and respectful environment for them. And I have another purpose. I've got two little girls. Uh, they are actually lucky enough to work in a place that are, go actually work. Um, they go to school at a place uh, that actually they call their things that they do work. Uh, so anyone here actually familiar with Montessori method or Montessori schools? Excellent. Um, and if you've talked to anyone, a uh, parent or kids have done, gone through it, their job is to be in flow the entire time. It's amazing. And what I really want to do for them is create a work environment when they're ready to enter the workforce that looks exactly like this. So they don't have to unlearn how to be in flow and maybe put up with some of the things that we had to put up with over the last 20, 30, 40 years. That's my second purpose. So I'd like to understand a little bit about uh, us in the room. So first of all, um, anyone here a member of a self-organizing team, team members? Excellent. Uh, leaders, leaders of self-organizing teams? Great, coaches, coaches of self, thank you very much, glad, glad you are here. Um, I have a question though, um, is anybody here have any of these certifications? Anyone know what these are? Okay, uh, sorry, you don't add some more information here. These are certifications. Okay, if you don't, don't feel bad, I don't either because I made them up. Um, but it begs the question, I mean, we're supposed to nurture self-organizing team to do, do this work, this amazing work. But uh, well, upon what basis of information are we actually helping them? And so it brings to mind um, some people that I, I learned about. And these two uh, people are actually, I would consider the world's authority on work teams. Um, so the first is uh, Dr. J. Richard Hackman, uh, professor at Harvard, too many accolades to mention. And the second person is uh, Dr. Ruth Wagman, who is a colleague of uh, Dr. Hagman. Uh, more than seven decades worth of, uh, of their lives dedicated to understanding and helping work teams. Uh, Dr. Hackman actually passed away in 2013, but uh, Dr. Wagman, a lot of her colleagues, and all of uh, Dr. Hackman's colleagues carry on that legacy. And so I was able to find this information. I'm really excited about it, which I'll share with you today. Um, but first I have a question. Is anybody familiar with this picture? Okay, this is a Salvador Dali, uh, painted in 1976. There's two versions of this. The first, uh, well, the one, the first is actually in Gier, uh, Spain, uh, Fier, Spain, and this one is in uh, the Salvador Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida. Had just the great opportunity to see a lot of Dali's work there, and this uh, picture specifically is quite impressive. It's about eight feet tall, six feet wide. Anyone know the name of this piece? Okay, so this is Gala contemplating the Mediterranean Sea, which at 20 meters becomes the portrait of Abraham Lincoln. That's the title. And so I was excited to go here, brought my daughter, uh, daughters, and I had my oldest, six years old, and, and I'm showing, we walk up to this, uh, the area where the, where the painting is, and, I, and I, tell my, I tell my girl, I said, look, do you know what this painting is? And she says, uh, no. I said, well, this is a man's head. She goes, I, 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 don't, I don't see it, though. I said, well, okay, you got you to gotta, you gotta just squint your eyes, and you'll see a man's head. And she squinted her eyes, and she saw a man's head. And if you squint your eyes, you'll probably see a man's head. You'll probably see Ab Abraham Lincoln's head. And it led me to think about a situation I was in, oh, about four years ago, when I was in a talk sort of like this, or maybe in a class, maybe you read a blog uh, yourself, Someone showed you this picture, and they said, this is self-organization. And if it is self-organization, I have a few questions. Which one's the scrum master? Who's the manager? 
What's their product? But, you know, I mean, this is, this is sort of, it's a metaphor, right? And so I, I was frustrated, though, so I asked a few questions about what, why is this self-organization? And, and there's a story about how all living things are self-organized, and uh, that's a natural way of evolution, the way things go, and all good stuff. And I, I took it, I was like, yeah, I, I get it now, I get it. And really what someone was asking me to do was sort of squint. Like, squint, you see self-organization based on this story. And then it brought to mind uh, a case uh, at the, uh, that was tried at the Supreme Court, brought before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court building. If anyone came in early this weekend or you're from here, this is the Supreme Court building. And there's a case that was brought to the Supreme Court, which some people have heard the quote from it, but it's the most popular quote or one of the most notable uh, quotes from the Supreme Court. And it was uh, written by this man, Potter Stewart, uh, a justice at the Supreme Court. They were trying, or they were uh, looking at a case where uh, Nico Jacobellis from Ohio, he got um, he got convicted and, try, and tried, and, and essentially had fined, and he was doing something that was not really acceptable to the. Uh, uh, he was breaking some laws, and Potter Stewart wrote the actual um, uh, opinion on it, and opinion on it. There was actually a lot of opinions on it, but he wrote and a majority opinion on it. Here's what he said. He said, I shall not today attempt further to define the kinds of material I understand to be embraced within that shorthand description. That's not memorable. But he goes on. He says, but perhaps I could never succeed in intelligibly doing so. He's sort of admitting it's a really hard thing to describe. But here's where it kind of screws up. But I know when I see it, I know what he's Knows it when he sees it. What was he actually referring to? Anyone remember? Anyone know? What was that? Pornography. Obscenity, right? So he was talking about this movie, Les Amants. Um, and Nico Jacobellis played this movie, got fined, spent some nights in jail. And uh, Potter Stewart said, I know pornography, I know obscenity when I see it, but this is not it. Makes me think about this picture again, because... I started using a picture like this, and maybe it had schools of fish, maybe it had a swarm of bees, and I was telling my teams and individuals that I serve, something like this is self-organization. And then I started to feel really bad about myself. Because I don't think it's a good answer. It's a great metaphor, but not a good answer. It's not helpful. So I had to think a little harder. You think about what standards am I holding it myself to as a coach? As a professional, right? So let's, let's use some examples. Because I um, am an accredited uh, trainer at Lean Combine University, what, what do we pride ourselves in? Pragmatic, actionable, evidence-based, evidence. And let's think about Dr. Hackman. What did he base his life's work on? Useful research. What can I do to extend the knowledge, right, within academia, as well as the working person. Practitioners just like us. So I was absolutely inspired with this. And really what I was wrestling with was uh, this idea of congruence. So what is congruence? Congruence is when our actions are aligned with our beliefs and values. And so I was wrestling with my congruence. Like I'm helping people, but am I really helping people? And so let's, test, let's use an example. Um, this is a rental car. Uh, anyone here have a rental car this week? Rented a car at one time? I'm sure you have. When you get in the rental car, what's the first thing you do? You likely adjust the seat. That's what I do, I'm a small person, so I gotta scoot it up. Uh, I'm gonna adjust the mirrors a little bit because uh, I have to adjust the seat, everything else is screwed up. And then I'll probably then um, mess with the radio, right? Put on my favorite station or pair it with my phone, and I'm ready to go. Let's think about another situation where you're with a team. And maybe you just joined the team, but for whatever reason, you don't think you're staying, or that it's not going to be a long-lived team, but what do you actually do on that first day that you're on that team? Well, you're going to find out a few things like, hmm, what time is lunch? Where's the vacation calendar? What time's our staff meeting? Uh, when's our one-on-ones? You know, basic stuff. But then we have to think again about that car. And what if you own that car? Think about the car that you own now. How do you feel about that car you own that's different than this rental car? You might actually care for your car. 
You might even love your car. I talk to people all the time. They say they love their car. You probably love your car. And when you care for it, you do things for it. What do you do to it? Right? Well, you care for it, but, but what actually helps you care for it? Probably have one of these. It's a manual. Right? Tells you when to do really important things so the thing doesn't break down. And now let's consider you have a team and you love that team and you care for that team. You want that team to do great things for a long time. What do you do? This is what I do. I check this book. This is my manual. It took me a while to figure it out. And we're going to go into it. But if you love this team and you care for it, wouldn't you want to do it? Wouldn't you want to take care of it based on research? Decades and decades of research, not some metaphors as to how birds fly and you know, fish swim in a circle, avoid predators. It's not helpful. So we're going to get into the model here, uh, the, the work of Dr. J. Richard Hackman and Ruth Wagman. Let's cover some conventions. If you open up that manual, you're going to see some like, little things here that draw your attention. What should I care about in this manual? So some things in the book will say, danger, this will kill you. This will say, warning, this might kill you. And caution, this is going to hurt a little bit. So what are some examples in a, in a, in a, in a car owner's manual? They'll say, don't close your hand in, a, in an automatic window, because that will hurt a little bit. Do you really need to be told that? Maybe. Or just might say, if you don't follow these instructions, you could die. That's pretty, that, you want that in that box. You want that warning there to say, hey, if something happens, if you don't do this thing, bad things will happen to the thing that you love, the thing that you care about. So I'm going to uh, refer to some other conventions here. This is uh, something that Dr. Hackman wrote. And this is sort of the basis of how I started now looking at teams, which is things are not as they seem. Okay? Look a little bit deeper, and you'll be surprised at what's going on within a team. Why? Because a team is a social system. And you need to understand some things about social systems to actually take care of them, to help them. And I'm going to refer to these other things, which are our values, our beliefs, our principles. And I'm going to take Dr. Hackman's principles and see if we can be congruent with this method that we're here professing. We're helping teams, individuals, do great work. So that's... I'm going to try and take this thing forward. So let's consider first what it means to be a good team. And Dr. Hackman and his colleagues wrote out three criteria. One, are you actually delivering on the services that you intend to be doing, and do the customers like it? Two, is your team growing? Is your capability of your team growing? Are they getting better? And three, how about the individuals on that team. Are they actually learning? Are they getting something out of it? Are they getting some love, some other attention, something else they may not be getting somewhere else? That's what we look for in an effective team. That's what Dr. Hackman and Dr. Wagman did. And I think it's a great point to look at. And it's also highly congruent with our beliefs. Highly congruent. But the question I have for you is this. Have you ever been in an organization where they say they value all these three things? But when stuff gets really tight, when you're in a squeeze, which two do you drop? Are you telling me you drop customer service and team growth and go for individual learning when you're in a squeeze? I don't think so. You likely drop the growth in the individual learning. And let's then think about congruence, which is if we believe that this makes an effective team, we need to value all three. And if we don't, use a different model. Just to be honest, use a different model. Because a lot of you are working in organizations that only do number one. That's their value. But if you want the other two, let's talk about this model. So let's get to the conditions. Um, but first, we can't talk about conditions about causes. And what Dr. Hackman says is that because teams are social system, he says they create their own reality. You cannot cause a team to do great work. You can wish it, but you can't cause it. 
And a lot of the thinking today, I mean, recently, if you did some management uh, workshops and training, they're telling you things about just be this charismatic leader, really engage, deliver that message, and good things will happen. And the other thing that you'll learn, because I've been in those classes, is just keep an eye on those interpersonal interactions. As long as everyone's getting along, the team will do great work. The thing about interpersonal interactions is that the actual causal loop is likely backwards. Because when a, a leader looks at a team, they go, oh, this team is performing so poorly because they're not getting along. Right? Usually the opposite. There's something else going on that's causing the team to not get along. So we want to look at the conditions, focus on the conditions that help teams become great. And luckily, it's a small set. It's not a big list, small set of conditions. Uh, we can interpret them a lot of ways, but it's a small set. What we're saying is focus on the conditions and stop pretending that you can cause a team to do great work. You can't. You're kidding yourself. It's a social system. Human beings. So what are the five conditions? We'll go through these in order. First is real team. Second is compelling direction. I like how I heard Einheit today. I'll continue to use that. We'll go into that in detail. Number three, enabling structure. Number four, supportive context. Number five, expert coaching. Good coaching. So by the definition of the doctors, what is a real team? Not to really keep anybody, uh, uh, to uh, disparage anybody, but these are definitions from a social perspective. What is the definition of a real work team? One, is it stable? Tons of research been done on actually uh, uh, on teams and whether they can actually perform with or without uh, stability. And uh, do in the doctor's words, it's the, the, the evidence is incontrovertible. You've got to have some stability within a social system to be able to enable teams to learn how to work together. That's a given. The second thing is, is your team bounded? And there's three conditions for bounding a team. Let's look at the first. Underbounding. Has anyone ever worked on a work group or a committee before? Okay, I have. I've been on a ton of them. And usually what happens is that you might, you might be volunteered, you might have been nominated, and you and 12 other lucky people get on this work group and committee. And then you join this conference call on a Friday, 3 o'clock. That's when we're supposed to meet. And everyone gets on the call and you do your uh, uh, introductions. I'm so-and-so. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. And you kind of just can I get, get to know each other? And you say, here's what we all agree to do. We're here for this goal. And then let's talk about who's going to take the action items away. All right? You get back on that call next Friday, 3 p.m. And there's nine people. And three of them are new. So what do you do? All right, let's get some introductions going. Hi, I'm so-and-so. I was here on the last call. I'm the new person. Uh, here's what we agreed to last time. And um, here's our action items for the next meeting. You can get together on that call next Friday, 3 p.m. And there's 15 people. And some of them are new, some of them are on the first call, some of them are both the first and second call. And really what's happening is you don't know who you can count on. You cannot actually create an effective performance strategy, delivery strategy, when you don't know who you can count on. I've been on enough of them to know that's actually true. But we needed a ton of research to prove it, so here it is. What about overbounded? Overbounded is a team that is only focused on itself. And we've seen a few of them. It's pretty interesting when it happens. They're the team that's so gung-ho about their team identity, and they came together, and we have this shared purpose, but it's our shared purpose. And then uh, when someone else asks them for help, they say, nope. We're our own team, we do our own thing. And then when they figure out they need help, here's what they say, nope. Because we're our own team, we do our own thing, we don't need anybody help, anybody's help, we're just our own thing. That's overbounded, and we've seen those. What are we looking for? We're looking for a clearly bounded team. You know who you are, and you know who you're not. Okay. We talk a little bit about um, liquidity, 
flavor liquidity in, in Kanban, and uh, how can we, in the, it's, it's a great thing, it sounds like it from a flow perspective. Where's the risk here? If we're gonna do labor liquidity, we're gonna let people float and be, uh, you know, you're, you're not instant available resources, are so instantly available now. What should we do to actually mitigate that? We can be more transparent about it. At least if I knew which people were coming or not coming and why they're not coming, you can mitigate that. But as a general statement, just be aware, underbounding can actually enable liquidity quite well. But it can also kill your strategy your performance strategy. Be aware of that, okay? Don't do it blindly. So let's talk about the team task. So there's two ways to look at how you offer a group of people work. The first is, do you offer a group of people work, but you offer to that group of people with the person's name, such as Adam. Hey team, here's Adam's work. Well, that's kind of weird, because we're a team, but you gave Adam the work. That's called a co-acting group, okay? It means you don't necessarily need to interact, but you sort of just do the same thing. Now, if you've seen a call center, that's usually how it goes. Rows and rows of people answering a call, can do everything you need to do, they hang it up. They're a co-acting group, they're doing great work, but they're not, an inter they're not an interactive work team. So what are we really thinking about? We're really worried about interacting groups, which are real work teams, which is, do you have to be interdependent to complete the actual work? If the answer is yes, there's a good chance teamwork might emerge. And the danger is treating an interacting group like a real team and treating a team with co-acting group work. Once you confuse the two, everybody's confused and your performance suffers. So what about Kanban? The good thing is Kanban helps us in both situations. So you can take a co-acting group and create a per, uh, a, an aggregated personal Kanban board, right? Visualize your work, address them over burdening, and you don't feel bad that you're not a team or not. You don't even know, right? It could be the start of something. And we also have another pattern available too, which is sort of like the start of a Kanban board, not necessarily a service delivery workflow, but at least work item H doesn't have somebody's name on it. You're offering the team the work. And the team will do the work in that manner. So what's great about this model is it allows us to address, well, what's great about Kanban is allows us to address these two types of work teams and help them evolve. So we need to talk a little bit about the limited authority. This is also an important component of a real team, which is you know what you can do and you know what you can't do. And we've been talking about self-organization and usually in my organization, other organizations, you use the word self-organizing, they automatically hear self-managing, and then a lot of managers get really, really frightened for their jobs. Or people laugh, oh, it'll never, it'll never work, ha. Yeah, it's gonna be no anarchy, it's, yeah. Listen, uh, you need to address authority, even in Kanban, especially in Kanban. Even when you start to do now, the little things you're gonna ask them, which is visualize work, it's a change in authority, okay? Limiting whip, who's limiting it? We need to address it, but let's talk about um, self-organization in, the, in, the, in, the, in a sort of a, a span, right? So if you've read the traditional American Psychological Association literature, they sort of address sort of this span of work or span of teams in which they exist, and the first is manager-led, um, and let's take a look at Manager Led. I have, uh, I keep picking on Frederick Winslow Taylor. I, I don't really have a thing against him. He's actually did a lot of great work for this country. It's, it's um, amazing. But uh, if you've ever written the book, uh, if you've ever read this book, um, this is what Manager Led actually looks like from the extreme. So this is an org chart if you're practicing Taylorism. You've got a lot of people telling you how to do that work for the one worker. Okay, that's the extreme. Not all manager-led teams are like this. So don't take this to mean that the man all manager-led teams look like this. You've probably been on some great manager-led teams. Okay. In the middle, we have this self-managing, self-designing, and really on the far end, we have self-governing. You might have heard of holacracy. What's interesting, though, is um, I've taken a look at Dr. Hackman's work, uh, Dr. Wagman's uh, work, and I'll do a quick search. 
and I'll try and find self-organizing. How many hits? Zero. They're social scientists. Um, they have different words. These are great words for it. Um, self, at least from what I've seen, self-organizing really comes from biological sciences. It's, that's, that's okay. It's a respected science as well. Um, but I talked to Dr. Wagman. And I said, look, I mean, we're in this agile thing, and people keep saying this word, and I'm confused. Are you confused? Um, and, and she said it in a way that I think was respectful, but at the same time, uh, really evident of maybe how we've picked this up. She said, when people use that term without context, it's not helpful. Same way that, hey, we're agile. Is that helpful? You're not agile. Is that helpful? So we want to add some parameters around that. We can do that with some delimited authority. Um, and what's really important here from delimited authority, as Dr. Hackman says, and please think about this, if you're going to coach anyone who's going to actually delimit some, share some authority, you can call it empowerment, you can call it whatever you want. It takes skill and emotional maturity. And not everybody has it right away. So even if you're going to have a program that introduces evolutionary incremental change, this might still be a big deal. So let's not overlook that. That might be something you might need to coach some leaders on, some coaches on, and some team members on. Do not blow this off. It's easy to say, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's, in, our, it's in our principles. Yeah, it is, clearly in our principles. Make policies explicit. So my suggestion is what we've done is we pay more attention. We pay more attention when we're introducing the term self-organization, self-managing, right? Okay, so that's uh, five conditions. I'm going to talk about Einheit, because I just learned it today, so I'll keep using it. So um, compelling direction is another key condition that you have to have to support effective teams. So what does compelling direction look like? It's clear. It's consequential. It means it's important. Talk about meaningful work. Dr. Chikmensi, hi said that, meaningful work, asking that question. And is it challenging? We can, we can refer everything, honestly, back to uh, Dr. Chick Mansi High. Is it challenging? Is it in the flow channel? What's a good example of compelling direction? Well, here's one. And in the spirit of us being near Washington, DC, here's one. Uh, it's spoken in 1961, addressing Congress. This nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. Pretty clear. Sounds pretty important. Oh, by the way, this sounded impossible back then. They didn't even have the technology to have the technology to go to the moon. But this is what compelling direction looks like. And maybe for other teams, it's different. And it's an interesting test you can take to figure out if your team has compelling direction. If you have a cadence, which you should, we recommend that. You have a cadence for some, some sort of feedback loop. Uh, you can call it the retrospective, and you have that retrospective, and you ask the team a question, and the leader a question. What is this team here for? And have them write it individually. And see how many different answers you get. And that will tell you whether or not your team actually understands its compelling direction. And if it doesn't, it's a really good coaching opportunity. Or maybe there isn't one. That's an even better one. Maybe there isn't a compelling direction for this team. What should we be doing? Let's align them with another product, another business that actually has work that's compelling. We see this. Another thing uh, Dr. Hackman says is we want to actually be insistent and unapologetic about establishing the end states, which is the goal, and equally unapologetic and insistent to not Tell you how to do it. So because you have two dimensions, we can turn anything to a Cartesian matrix, which I've done here. Say on the bottom right, we have our ends, and the means on the left. And what are we looking for? We're looking for psychological engagement, which means I'm going to tell you where we're going to the top of that mountain. But I'm not going to tell you what size spikes to wear. I'm not going to tell you how much rope to bring. I'm not even going to tell you what to do once you get across that stream. I'm not going to tell you. Why? Because you're all smart people. If you want to be psychologically engaging, treat them, treat your workers, like they have the intellect to actually do the job. 
What happens when you don't? What are the other permutations? Anarchy. No ends and no means. And I've seen this too. It's hard to believe it. What about no ends but lots of means? Has anyone ever been on a team that's been micromanaged? Do you feel psychologically engaged when someone gives you a goal, or in fact doesn't give you a goal, but gives you a long checklist of things to do? But you don't need to know about the goal, you just need to do the checklist. And what about underutilization, which means I'm going to give you the ends, and I'm going to give you lots of means too, which means I'm going to give you the map to climb this mountain, and I'll tell you exactly what to do every step of the way. Don't you worry. Why is it under, underutilization? Because you're not using intellect of the team. So what, uh, what congruence do we have? We have lots of them. From a service perspective, understanding our customer's focus and needs. Improving collaboratively, evolving experimentally. These are things that a psychologically engaged team would do if you let them. And that's the key word, if you let them. Because you, you've seen some choices. You've been in some organizations where they're all over the place for some. Maybe 90% of the stuff that they give is anarchy, but then the 1% is engagement. Try to be consistent about the way that you're providing guidance to your team on the compelling direction. Let's talk about enabling structure. We don't have to drain this here. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, uh, just an honor for me to be in his presence. What's he talking about? He's talking about the design of the work. So Dr. Hackman came up with the model in 1975 with uh, his colleague Oldham, and he called the, design, uh, the work uh, characteristics uh, model, a design, uh, work design characteristics model. And it looked kind of like, sounded kind of like flow. It's cool. I was, I was blown away. I was like, oh, this is awesome. So we don't need to spend too much time on here. Let's talk about some other things. Team composition. So uh, this is a reference to a popular little meme out there. Anyone know what I'm referring to? Two pizza team, two pizza roll. What is a roll? You should be able to, uh, don't have a team that you can't feed with two pizzas. Right? Why is that? Um, so I referred to uh, Frederick Brooks earlier, combination, uh, combinatorial explosion of communication channels, which means if you're doing interdependent work and you need to collaborate, it's really hard to communicate all those channels with a lot of people. If you're doing interdependent work. If you're not, then you're co-acting group. So knock yourself out. Ten pizza teams. Do it. But if you have interdependent work, you're going to make things hard for yourself if you design the team to actually be hard to manage on its own. You're not actually enabling self-organization, self-managing, self-designing. What's also interesting about uh, this picture is there's two types of pizzas. And what I've seen and we've seen and you've seen probably is a lot of uh, what would con uh, be considered a common dysfunction teams, which is they sure look a lot alike. Everyone kind of looks the same or has the same skills, right? Something about it doesn't look fine. I mean, they're, all, they're like, like, we'll get along. And by the way, uh, going back to the, the causes, um, there's actually a negative correlation between the, the, way, the, uh, the way that a team actually gets along and its performance. It's slightly negative, which means you look at a team and they're getting along. What that means is they're getting along. Does it mean they're doing great work? Likely not. So take advantage of your interdependent work by actually having Oh, unique type of people to bring different experiences to the work. And the third thing he says about compelling direction is do these three things, which is under the guise of core norms, which is what are the behaviors of our team? What's actually acceptable? What actually binds us together? Let's look at these three. First is one, proactively scan the environment and look for threats and take advantage of opportunities, which is don't be overbounded. Don't just put, stick your head in the sand. Be aware. Look around. Proactively scan. And two and three, here's what he says. He says, set the limits of acceptable behavior. And his suggestion is this. 
Identify the two things we will always do as a team. What will we always do? Okay. And then, what are the two things we'll never do? Absolutely not acceptable, this behavior on this team. And this is an initial guidance. These are just core norms. And then he says something great. He says, and by the way, after you do these things, which you should do these things, then let secondary, norm, uh, secondary norms emerge. So what, that, what are the secondary norms? Right? Oh, punctuality. Right? When we take breaks. Something else to help us kind of get along, but do these first. So we see a lot of teams with great team agreements. Right? Say something like, we will always pair, always write the, uh, always write the start date on your ticket. Right? Those are secondary norms. But you've got to focus on what establishes the behavior of a team and be clear about it. Here's what we love about this. Make them explicit. Post them. General practice. Okay? And it aligns with all our other uh, principles and practice as well. Very happy to see that. Let's look at the supportive context. A fourth item. From a uh, supporting context perspective, does your organization have a rewards and recognition system that actually acknowledges the good work of teams? Well, let me ask you another way. Does your organization have a rewards and recognition system that acknowledges the good work of individuals? And a lot of people are going to nod their head. Okay? So as a leader of a team, as a coach of a team, maybe as an individual on a team, what can you do? You need to start thinking about how do we actually reward good behavior at the team level. Because if you don't, then just stand by and watch team performance erode. If you're not going to address it, don't expect it to happen. Look at your rewards and recognition system. Ooh, educational system. I'm excited about this. Four teams. Is there actually resources available for them to actually learn, like do their work? And so Lean Kanban University, because I'm an accredited Kanban uh, trainer, uh, proud, to, proud to be doing it. It's helping our organization. We know it. We can tell. Adam told a story this morning about it. We know it's working. Here's another fun one, uh, Okaloa Flow Lab. This is a, a new simulation that Patrick and Arlette uh, have been working on. We're proud to be beta testers of this solution, but essentially, this is part of our educational system. What are we doing to actually help people practice Kanban? And is it working? We think it is. Excellent tool. Excellent teaching tool. Now, the great thing about teaching Kanban and planning it is that from a supporting context perspective, an organization actually needs a system to dispense information. And if you're practicing Kanban, guess what? You teach Kanban, you practice Kanban, you get an information system out of it. It's an example of an information system we help, uh, we teach. Uh, again, coming from uh, Patrick and, and our Let's Work, end-to-end -end Kanban, which is, if you're a delivery team, what's the information you need? Oh, what to work on, what the requirement is, whatever. And we see a lot of teams in starvation once they start practicing Kanban, and it will happen. If you teach a delivery team, and they start picking up Kanban, you'll see some starvation. And we address it with this. We put in the information system. Happy to see that's congruent with our practices and principles. So what does Hackman say about the unsupportive context? Is anyone familiar with uh, the work of Tantrum Columns and General Stanley McChrystal, most recent book, Team of Teams? This is a metaphor that we love, but essentially they use the metaphor of the gardener. So this book was, uh, Dr. Hackman wrote this in 2002, just as applicable today. So it's this, you can have a great seedling, and you can paint, you can just, you can, you can plant it in asphalt. And what happens? It dies. You can take all the great things about a team and put it somewhere where actually you know it's not going to thrive, and they never will happen, it will die. So you need to look at the context in which you're putting the teams, your real teams, with compelling direction, 
the enabling structure. Where are you putting those teams? Look at these three things. Let's talk about expert coaching. because I, I teased it a little bit. Thank you very much for, uh, if you follow me on Twitter here, I teased a little bit, and even in my speech, which is, uh, can a team be robust to bad interventions? Really what I'm saying is, can it be robust to bad coaching? Let's answer that question. First of all, what does uh, this pillar really mean, this, this, this fifth condition? What we're talking about is available expert coaching. Okay, there's probably a ton of expert coaching available, or maybe there isn't, but let's say it is. There is expert coaching that exists. Is it actually available to the team that needs it? Let's focus on those two, because there might be a lot of coaching available. The question is, is anyone actually picking up the phone? And then how would that coach support the team? They, we we want to look at three areas. One is the effort. Okay. Is there something about the way that they're behaving that, that would, require, would require some intervention to help them engage more psychologically? What about the way that they work? Right? There's something about their process, something about their specific trade that someone can help them with. Say, hey, did you think about doing it this way? Right? Asking questions. Or are they missing something? Missing something about how the work should be done or specific skills that they need to do this work on their own. We want to look at these three areas. This is the focus of coaching. Notice what I didn't say. Charismatic leadership. Interpersonal relationships and harmony. We're not talking about that. Although, it's easy to see. And that's why people intervene, because it's easy to see. You see a team not getting along, so how do you help them out? Hey guys, I'm here to help you get along. Not helpful from a research perspective. So what does Dr. Hackman say about coaching? Coaching just needs to be available. And he doesn't care who provides it. And you probably don't either. Somebody has to. And that's coaching verb, not coach as which is also pretty scary for some organizations who don't believe in coaches and coach, coaching even. But it's coaching. Doesn't matter who provides it, regardless of their formal position. That's what I love about this. It's really congruent with our management principles. Doesn't matter who does the coaching. So let's talk about the effects of good coaching and bad coaching. And we'll look at it through two lenses. And the first is, let's say you did a really terrible job of setting up those five conditions. No real team, no compelling direction, no supportive context, no enabling structure, and by the way, no coaching available either. What would happen if you put some coaching on top of there? Well, here's what it looks like. All right, so what is this saying? First of all, it's saying, if you have a poorly designed team with poor conditions, and you bring in, oh, I don't know, think of a great coach. I don't know, John Wooden, who's passed away, right? But known as a, a, a basketball coach uh, in the NCAA, uh, has a legacy of coaching, you brought them in, what would happen if you brought John Wooden in to coach his team? Nothing. Because it's, it's nothing there, right? Let's bring in a very bad coach, right? What happens when you bring in a bad coach to a poorly designed team? You destroy them. They don't do good at all. It gets ugly. Maybe you've seen this. Maybe you didn't recognize it. But think back now, you probably had a great team at one point, and something happened. There was some weird intervention. So what is bad coaching, right? So the opposite of the things we talked about, right? Speci specifying all the ends and the means, allowing anarchy. That's what bad, uh, a bad team conditions, a poorly designed team looks like. Now let's think about what a great team looks like. All the five conditions, you've nailed it. You're super awesome. It's hard to do. What happens when we do some coaching? Let's again focus on the bad coach. When you put a bad coach with a well-designed team, what happens? Nothing. They're insulated from this terribleness of the coaching. 
right? But what happens if you have a greatly designed team and you give them a great coach? Good things. You actually increase their performance, right? Uh, so fans of uh, Nassim Taleb, certainly I am. Anyone else here? Nassim Taleb fans, excellent. Um, what does this look like? It's the concavity, uh, concavity effect, which is really a bad thing, and convexity effect, which is a good thing. Uh, what is robustness? It means um, you are not harmed by bad things, and you really benefit from good things. So this looks like robustness. So I've answered the question. Yeah, you can be robust. A team can be robust. Uh, if you, uh, so if you haven't read the book, um, you can teach you a little heuristic, or concavity, I'm going to get these all mixed up. What you can do is you can take these little funny eyes, and you can put them on your curve, and you can say, okay, well, uh, a sad face is, is a bad effect, and a, and a positive face is a good effect. Okay? What does this mean to coaches, leaders, team members? Uh, I'm going to say something that might be a little bit controversial. If someone calls you in, says, I've got this team, I want you to come coach, and you look at it, and these things are all in I mean, I mean un underbounded, not stable, no compelling direction. You'd, co you'd be tempted to say, hey, I'm, I'm a coach. I can come in and fix all these things. Or you could just say, you know what? Save your money. Spend it on fixing these conditions. As much as I love your money, this would be a really fun thing to do. I'd be here for a while fixing these things. You can do these. You can fix these things. And then call me back and then see what happens. If you're a great coach, you'll see great things happen on a well-designed team. So what are we really getting at here? It's really the big takeaway here. For a self-organizing team, we expect leadership at every level. So not only coaching at every level, leadership at every level. Now what does leadership at every level look like? So Dr. Hackman says, do whatever you can, whoever you are, to put the five conditions in place. And then two, keep them there. That's what leadership at every level looks like. That's what we've been telling our teams now. It's meaningful. Meaningful guidance. Research-based, evidence-based. This gives us some confidence. I don't feel so ashamed anymore. Let's talk about congruence. One more time. We talk about flow a lot. It's a great metaphor. Because Mihai Chikmensi High was here. Love that even Dr. Hackman understands the value of flow. And how, if you have a poorly designed team, bad conditions, you disrupt flow. You create resistance. How do you remove that resistance? Address the conditions. This is my obsession for the last four years. Um, I'm happy to share it with you. And anyone wants to talk about it afterwards, happy hour, we can talk all night about it. The five conditions, you can drain these things. You can spend a whole day on each of these five conditions and the subconditions and so forth. Well, let's go back to what Dr. Hackman really did. He gave us that five simple things. You can at least focus on You start doing it today. Everyone can hear. You can start looking at the team and say, are we a real team? Are we a co-acting group doing real teamwork? Do we really have a compelling direction? You can ask yourself that right now, without even the team there. Just think about the situation. And then you can do something about it, which is address them. This is the power of this model. I'm very, very excited to share this with you. I hope you get as much out of it as we have. And uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of resources that we can get to. So the first is this. Let's say you don't want to read this book. I've heard it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a reader. I'm not a reader. OK, fine. Uh, you, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's not uh, on Audible. But what you can do is you can actually take a survey based on this research that's taken by thousands of teams. And here's what they'll do. You'll, you'll, you'll email Trex. He's a really nice guy. You'll email Trex. Do it right now. Or do it after the talk. Say, I want some more information. And he'll, send you a, he'll send you some information. He'll send you a link and say, you can set up your team to do this. And we'll do a test team for you. And you'll get some pretty pictures. Because pictures are always good for management. And they'll give you, additionally, some really good advice. They'll say your compelling direction sucks. Here's what you can do about it. If you don't want to read the book, I strongly recommend reading the book. 
some more re uh, uh, references I'll go very quickly. These are the two books uh, that I've been strongly influenced by. Dr. Wagman's is the senior leadership teams, which is you're probably also helping some senior leadership teams. And guess what? They have the same problems as your work teams. So now you've got more tools in your tool belt, if you so choose. Great papers written by Dr. Wagman, Dr. Hackman. Uh, this presentation is available on uh, Prezi, which I've tweeted out, so follow me afterwards and you'll get that link right away. How about some articles? You know, Harvard, say what you want about Harvard. Uh, seems to be something that uh, a lot of people go to, which by the way also has some bad advice. Let's just be honest. Dr. Hackman has some great advice, but there's also a ton of advice that says, hey, keep a lookout on those interpersonal interactions. Keep looking for the happiness and that uh, uh, charismatic leadership. So just be aware. Uh, podcasts, uh, Dr. Christopher Lowe has some podcasts with Dr. Ruth Wagman, uh, Trucks with Profit talks about uh, the team diagnostic survey and he's even a webinar with Dr. Ruth Wagman. And uh, just for uh, a personal plug, so uh, we talk about forming teams or real teams at J.P. Morgan Chase. You can check out this podcast as well. Uh, we talk about forming uh, teams, real teams, real interdependent work teams uh, in the self-forming model. Okay? And we do it in a safe way. Uh, it's not for everybody. I promise you, it's not for everybody. Um, but if you're interested, just give it a listen. And just some special thanks. Uh, can't thank Dr. Ragman myself, uh, uh, Hackman. Uh, but his legacy continues on through his students and his colleagues, um, some other colleagues here as well. Uh, Okaloa, thank you for helping us on our journey. And that's it. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm smart enough to know that I'm, I'm the only thing. Uh, standing between us and a few drinks, and I certainly want them, so I'll be happy to address any questions you might have if you have any uh, up on the terrace on the fourth floor. Thank you very much. <laughs>